this morning. Praise the Lord for that. Thank you for your heartfelt singing. Uh, let me invite you to turn to Mark chapter 3 in your Bible. And as you're turning there, um, the message today is de- de- demented or delusional, demon-possessed, or divine. Um, Roughly between the years of 2000 to 2012, I taught a new member slash new Christian discipleship Sunday school class. So for over a little over a decade, um, I taught new believers on a regular basis on a Sunday morning. And uh, it was fairly consistent. Um, every once in a while, the, one of the new believers would say, my parents or my relatives or my family think that I've joined a cult. Uh, They think that I've gone off the deep end in regards to religion. Just because they attend Sunday school, Sunday morning service, uh, Wednesday night prayer service, and other meetings during the church uh, services during the week. So they were misunderstood. Their zeal for Christ in their newfound faith had been misinterpreted. We'll see that occurring this morning in our text even with Jesus' own family. You know, fanaticism has been defined as wildly excessive or irrational devotion, dedication, or enthusiasm. It's interesting that zeal for almost anything else is acceptable. You know, if I go and paint my face and paint my belly and paint my body just because of my favorite sports team, if I um, scream for my team until I lose my voice, If I get excited about a sport, a special event, a new car, a new model car, a prize fight or a championship game, if I get zealous and crazy about a sport or that type of thing, I'm just considered an enthusiast. I'm not considered demented or delusional. But when you're zealous about pursuing God, when you are and you are called crazy, cultish, or out of your mind, that is a different thing. Why is it that our culture does that? In fact, the world does that. When the Apostle Paul witnessed to to the gospel of Jesus Christ to a government official named Festus, back in Acts 26, 24, Festus returned with a loud voice and he said this, Paul, you're beside yourself. Much learning doth make thee mad. Right? So again, Jesus' very own family is declaring that he is delusional. So we'll seek to answer the question, was Jesus delusional, demon-possessed, or truly divine? And once we find the answer to that question, what do we do about it? So let's look at the first two verses in our text this morning, Mark chapter 3, verse 20. Okay, and you remember, this is in the context of of rising uh, opposition, rising popularity. Jesus has just come off the mountain after he's chosen his 12 apostles. He's gone into a house, probably Peter's house, the same place where um, the same place you know where the roof was dug up and the paralyzed man was dropped through. So he's in the house, and we see in verse 20, and the multitude cometh together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread, he and his disciples. And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said he is beside himself. So in our text this morning, we're going to see the critics of Jesus, both his family as well as the religious establishment, the Pharisees and the scribes. His family thought he was delusional. The word there for verse 21, his friends, is literally they who were of him. Some have translated his kinsfolk, those who are close to him. Uh, Again, this is not the apostles, but rather his relatives and his friends. Contrary to the false Catholic doctrine of of the perpetual virginity of Mary. Mary had other children, okay? Just turn a couple of chapters to Mark chapter 6, and let's just look at the text and how this is happening. In Mark chapter 6, verse 3, we read of the crowd saying, "Is Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. So apparently, the news has spread from Capernaum, about 15, 20 miles, to Nazareth, his hometown, where his mother and probably brothers lived and worked. They travel 15 to 20 miles 
because of the news that's happening. Tens of thousands of people are following this one called Jesus. It was normal for a rabbi to have a few followers, but tens of thousands? Back in Luke 4, 16, you don't have to turn there, but after Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, he makes a showing in his own hometown. He reads from the book of Isaiah, Luke 4, 16, and he says, This day, the signs of this Messiah are fulfilled in your hearing. And even his hometown crowd sought to throw him off a cliff. And now we have Mary and probably Jesus' younger brothers, four of them probably, coming to, to Capernaum, Hearing the rumors, there's not so much room for them to, so even as to eat, there's such a crowd, such craziness going on. And remember here, Jesus, we don't have a record of the father, Joseph, anymore, probably passed away. Jesus now has come from a place of security and of safety. He has probably had a good family name. He was in charge of the the family business. Okay, the carpenter shop and the construction business. So he has security and profession. He has safety and family all around him. And he leaves all this to do this. And rumor had it that the people were saying, is this the one? And they were going to force him to be king. You find that in John chapter 6. And so Mary and her sons come and say, he is beside himself. He has lost his mind. He has lost his senses. And they come, as it says, went to lay hold on him. They have come to take him by force, to take custody of him, because they think he has lost his mind. And the truth is, when a person gets saved and he's on fire for God, to all his contemporaries... To all those that were near him, think, he's got religion and he's lost his mind. I remember that was true of uh, my, my neighbor growing up. I was not a Christian. My, my neighbor and my father, they were drinking buddies. They got drunk every Friday or every paycheck just about. And one day he just stopped. And I asked Dad, Dad, why don't you and uh, Mark drink anymore? He said, oh, he's got religion. His life has changed. And it was changed, and he's a, he's a good friend now, even though I was a bad kid neighbor back then. But you know what? When people get saved and their life changes and they're on fire for God, people think there's something wrong with that person. And so the more like Christ we are, the more we'll experience the sorrow of being misunderstood by friends and family and coworkers. You know, if, if a young man graduates from high school and he goes and, and sets out to make a mark in the world and he says... I'm going to make my mark in the world. I'm going to make a fortune. And everybody's going, yeah, go, 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 right? They're cheering him on. But I remember when I told my dad I was going into ministry. We were sitting in a car at a stoplight. And he goes, really? You sure about that? You know, when someone wants to live for Christ and wants to be zealous, you're going to receive jeers and not cheers from those around you, especially if it comes from an unsaved world. So, first of all, his first critics we see here are his family. And they thought he was delusional. And then we see his foes here. Keep your finger in Mark chapter 3, but I want to I read a parallel passage in Matthew chapter 12. So, so we, get the, we get the context here. Again, remember, Jesus is getting away from the huge crowds. He's gone up to a mountain to pray. He's selected his 12 apostles. They've come down from the mountain, probably to the house of Peter in Capernaum. And, and then it begins to get crowded again, but probably on their way down from the mountain, something happens with, in view of the religious establishment, some scribes and Pharisees there. In Matthew chapter, 20, Matthew chapter 12, verse 22, I'm going to read the entire parallel passage and just point out some verses that we'll hit again. In Matthew 12, verse 22, Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him insomuch that the blind and the dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? So people are are getting excited. They're saying, He is the one. Look what he's doing. The, the, uh, The blind are made to see. The deaf are made to hear. The lame are made to walk. Could this be the guy? And so the religious establishment, you know, are following him around going, No, 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 no. He's not the guy. He's not the one. And look what they say here. 
after this public healing of a deaf and dumb man, a demon-possessed man. Verse 24 of Matthew 12, But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom, I want you to notice how many times the word divided is read here, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I, by Beelzebub, cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. And here's a key verse, verse 28. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost... It shall not be forgiven him. And here's a key phrase. Neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So this is a very serious matter. This is known as the unforgivable sin, the unpardonable sin. And so the religious leaders here could not deny the fact that the miracles occurred. There it is, right in front of them. Plain and simple, and the people see it as well. The evidence is there. It's irrefutable. They could not deny the fact that he could cast out demons. So the type of power, the only type of power that could cast out demons was either God himself or Satan, the prince or the chief of the demons or the devils. And so the, the, the Pharisees attributed it to Satan. So, the, so this accusation... That he's casting out by demons, he's casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub. Beelzebub, uh, ancient uh, deity, that, a false deity that people used to worship. He is the ruler or the prince of the demons. It's defined there. Sometimes you'll find the name Beelzebul. Beelzebul is, is a, a kind of a corruption or a sarcastic addition to the, to the root word Baal, which means lord of the flies or the lord of the dung. And so they are attributing the miraculous working power of Jesus Christ to Satan. Or he's doing it in the power of Satan. But Jesus answers, the Savior answers with some words of wisdom that are just, they're they're just beautiful. I mean, you know what a parable is. Okay, a parable is a story laid next to a set of facts or, or, or the circumstance and saying, look, compare this with this. And, you know, these parables are just punchy. They, they get right to the point. And so turn back to Mark chapter 3, and we'll we'll read the the Mark passage here. In Mark 3, verse 23, it says, Jesus called them unto him. The word called there means to, you know, to call or invite, but the same word is used in the court of law. There's a summons here. They are summoned. Come here, the ones who made this statement. Come here. And And he's talking to the ones who made this accusation before the people. And he says in verse 24, in the form of a parable, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. You know, this is where we get the the phrase, united we stand, divided we fall. Any person, any kingdom, any organization that is divided will not continue, at least in the state that is in. In fact, the end will be... Destruction, fall. So three times the word divided is mentioned here. Satan's goal is to control men through demons, not to free them through demons. And so Jesus just makes a clear and plain uh, rhetorical question that just makes sense, right? This is good old common sense. If Satan cast out Satan, why would he undo his work? That's not his goal, that's not his aim. Their reasoning is illogical, and therefore their conclusion is illogical. It's preposterous, preposterous to say 
that Jesus is casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub or Satan himself. So what is actually going on, though? The answer to what actually is going on, after he says, look, your, your, your assertion, your proposition, it's illogical, it's nonsense, it doesn't make sense, even a child can understand that. And then in verse 27, he goes, essentially, this is what's going on here. Here is what's going on when I am casting out demons. Verse 27 again. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his goods. You know, there's a book by, by, a, by, by a Jack Handy called Fuzzy Memories. And in it, the writer says this. There used to be a bully who would demand my lunch money every day. Since I was smaller, I would give it to him. Then I decided to fight back. I started taking karate lessons. But then the karate lesson guy said I had to start paying him $5 a lesson. So I just went back to paying the bully. <laughs> you know, there are plenty of people in this world that will find it easier to pay the bully rather than learn how to defeat him. But Jesus here has the power over the biggest bully of all. And what is actually going on in the casting out of demons? Satan is the strong man of the house. The house is his dominion. He is the prince and the power of the air. He's the god of this world. He's the ruler of this age on this earth ever since Adam handed over the scepter by listening to his instructions rather than God's. Satan is the strong man, but Jesus is the one who is stronger, who comes into the house, binds the strong man, and begins to spoil his goods. What are the goods? The goods are the souls of men. So what is actually going on here when I cast out demons? This is the fall of Satan's kingdom. And he says, we'll spoil. What Jesus is doing now is just a picture of what will ultimately happen at the second coming. Satan will be cast into the lake of fire for a thousand years. And what's happening now on the earth as Jesus is casting out demons and causing miracles, he is taking over. He is binding. He has bound the strong man. Satan is bound. He is a defeated foe. At the cross, he was defeated. At the resurrection, it was an exclamation point. He is a defeated foe, but there are some skirmishes still going on, and it needs to be mopped up, and that day will come. So that rhetorical question, how can Satan cast out Satan? You know, doesn't make sense. This is what's actually going on. Jesus has come. And remember that verse I told you to remember from uh, Matthew chapter 12? If I cast out demons by the power of God, then the kingdom of God has come. And it's taking over. It's reclaiming the souls of men and eventually the whole entire earth. And so we have back in verse 28 of Mark 3, the introduction of the unforgivable sin. Verse 28 says, Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men and blasphemies, wheresoever they shall be blaspheme but he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness you never will absolutely never it's never going to happen if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost but is in danger these people are in the danger zone of eternal judgment eternal damnation why verse 30 because they said he hath an unclean spirit so these are words of warning this is what is known as the unpardonable sin the unforgivable sin Jesus made it clear though okay the offer of grace, and back in verse 28, all manner of blasphemies, everything. If you blaspheme the, the Father, God the Father, you can still be saved. If you blaspheme the Son of God, you can still be saved. But then what makes this one so special? The language here is not so much that it says, but he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost is, is not such a one-time event, but rather it's an attitude of heart that continually happens, a continual rejection, a persistent a denial and resistance to the, the, the witness of the Holy Spirit of God as he presents truth and light. 
So when Jesus warned these Jewish leaders, he was actually also warning the Jewish nation. Listen, if you continually resist, if you continually reject the witness of the Holy Spirit that is confirmed in the works that I do, the miracles and the casting out of demons, that ultimately is unforgivable. When the Spirit came at Pentecost and the religious leaders, even after, even after the, 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 the followers of Christ did wonderful, marvelous works, these leaders refused to believe. They rejected the evidence and they died in unbelief. They sinned against the witness of the Spirit and could not be forgiven. You know, there are some purists who say you cannot commit the unforgivable, unpardonable sin today. In the strictest sense, I would agree in the strictest sense, because this is the reasoning. Jesus is not physically upon the earth. He's not physically uh, doing miracles, and he's not physically casting out demons. And so you cannot attribute that work to Satan. So in that sense, that cannot happen. But principally, I, I, I don't think you can say that. And here's the reason why. Okay, if you remember, we have to ask the question, what, what makes this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit so different from blasphemy against the Father and blasphemy against, against the Son? And remember, blasphemy is, is evil speaking, railing against, speaking evil of. What makes blasphemy of the Holy Spirit so different from the other types of blasphemy? What makes it so that I cannot, if I continue in this blasphemy, that I cannot receive pardon or forgiveness. I think we have to answer the question, what is the role of the Holy Spirit? Remember, each part of the, the Godhead, the Trinity, has a different function. Okay, God the Father started, planned, and sent, planned for redemption. He sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. 1 John 4.14 says exactly that. It says, and we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And, and we know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent. So God the Father sent the Son to be the Savior. Now what would God the Son do? What would Jesus do? In John 15, 26, he says this, But when the, comfort is, when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. God the Father sends the Son, and the Son sends the Holy Spirit. And the role of the Holy Spirit is to testify of Jesus Christ. And so, it is the Holy Spirit then, as Revelation 22 says, in the Spirit and the bride say, come. It's the Holy Spirit who, who woos, who draws. It's the Holy Spirit who opens up spiritual eyes. It's the Holy Spirit who illumines, sheds light on truth. It is the Holy Spirit who testifies of the work of Jesus Christ and imparts spiritual life. If we blaspheme and reject the Father and the Son, there's still hope because the Holy Spirit can still point to the work of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit can still humble us and bring us and grant us the gift of repentance. But if we, you know, behind the Father and behind the Son's work, but if we taste, we see the goodness of God, we see the, the truth of who the Savior is, and we continually reject it, what happens? We shut ourselves off from the only way of salvation. If you shut yourself off from the testimony and the salvation that is Jesus Christ, there is no other way. Can you commit the unpardonable sin? Well, Paul said this in Acts 13, 46, as he and Barnabas are on a missionary journey and they're witnessing to, to scribes, Pharisees, or the religious establishment, Paul says this, and it's interesting to note, he says, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, to the Jews. But seeing ye put it off from you, and here's the key word, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So the witness of the Holy Spirit is through the word of God into the, the hearts and the consciences of men. If men continually reject that truth 
of that convicting work and that convincing work of the Holy Spirit, and they reject it, there is no other way of salvation. That is indeed unpardonable. You know, I've had conversations with some people that say that the unpardonable, the unforgivable sin is a continual rejection of the Holy Spirit until death. In other words, um, only death puts a person beyond forgiveness. I think that's wrong for two reasons. Number one, in Matthew 12, 32, remember what I said as I highlighted one of the verses in Matthew 12. Verse 32 says, Whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this world, now, in this age, or the world to come. Okay, so, so Jesus is saying, it's not just that, you know, you can reject until you die. That's the un- Un- unpardonable or unforgivable sin. There is a point in time where the Holy Spirit convinces a person of truth, of light, of their own sinfulness, and, and, and God's uh, provision for forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And a person continually has the attitude of rejection. In fact, to the point where they say, Jesus, they call good evil and evil good. They call Jesus. Not a good moral teacher, but he's just an evil man like anybody else. There comes a point where the Holy Spirit will no longer knock on the door of that heart. 1 John five sixteen. you can turn there if you want, but this is the second reason why I think you can still commit the unforgivable sin of continual rejection. Okay? And by the way, no Christian, if you're a true Christian, you cannot commit the unpardonable sin. Because remember the offer of grace, all sins will be forgiven. You know, I've had conversations with some Christians who are saying, you know what, Pastor, I, I think I've lost my salvation because I've committed this sin, this sin, this sin, this sin. And I say, no, if you're truly born again, all, all means in the Greek, all, right? All your sins are forgiven. All sins and blasphemies, that's the offer of grace. But the sin of unbelief is unforgivable. The sin of rejection, rejecting the, the witness of the Holy Spirit is unforgivable. And it's debatable on what 1 John 5.16 means, but I think, I think this is what it means. In 1 John 5.16, it teaches that there is a sin unto death which is pointless to pray about. Let me read it. 1 John 5.16. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. And then there's the statement, there is a sin unto death, I do not say that he shall pray for it. Don't waste your time in praying for that. Some, some apply this to an, apost- an apostate, someone who, who was in the faith and then rejects it and goes away and never comes back because there is no other place for, for, for forgiveness, right? It could apply to that, but I think it also, in principle, applies to the, the work of the Holy Spirit in a person's heart. If they reject that work, eventually, God rejects them. Uh, so let me just define what it means, the unforgivable sin. The unforgivable sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is an attitude of continual rejection of the work of the Holy Spirit, so much so that he withdraws forever with his convicting power so that we are never able to repent and be forgiven. Now this is serious, this is sobering, and it ought to be. How should we view, how should we live in view of this possibility? So let me, let, me, let me urge you, run from sin with fear and trembling. There comes a point in a life of sin after which the Holy Spirit will no longer grant repentance. There comes a point where the heart will pass over into irrevocable hardness of heart through the deceitfulness of sin. You know, Jesus said sin was serious so much so in Mark 9, 43. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life maimed than with two hands to go into hell in unquenchable fire. Okay, the person who continually rejects the witness of the Holy Spirit and the provision of forgiveness in Jesus Christ, they are like the buzzard who spots a carcass on a floating piece of ice in the river. 
He lands on this ice. He begins to eat the carcass. He knows it's dangerous because, he, because you know, the falls, the waterfalls are just ahead. But he looks at his wings and says to himself, you know what, I can fly to safety at any time. And he goes on eating, and just before the ice goes over the falls, he springs, spreads his wings to fly, but his claws are frozen in the ice, and there is no escape. Neither in this age, nor in the age to come. The spirit of holiness has forsaken the arrogant sinner. So to put it simply, yes, God is the God of the second chance. He's the God of the third chance. He's the God of the fourth chance. His mercies are new. But he's also the God of the last chance. If you continually reject the truth and the light, you will no longer receive truth and light. That's a sobering truth, but let me end end that part with a delightful truth. The offer of grace. Back in Mark 8, I mean 328. All sins will be forgiven, the sons of men. And whatever blasphemies they utter. I urge you, I plead with you in the name of Jesus Christ, if you've just been playing church, if you are a believer by name only, by words only, repent today. Today is always the day to repent. Agree with God of your sinfulness and turn from that sin and cast yourself on the mercy of Jesus Christ because someday you might not be able to. And so Mark here sandwiches that truth, okay? There's going to be criticism from family. There's going to be criticism from the outside world, okay? Don't let your heart enter into that criticism of what the Holy Spirit is doing. And then his family returns here as we see the clarification of Jesus in regards to who really is his family. Back in Mark 6, I mean 331, there came his brethren and his mother. Okay, that's what we saw in verses 20 and 21. Mark 3.31, there came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, sent unto him, calling him. So the crowd is so thick and so, so dense that they can't get in. They can't even eat. And then his family here is outside wanting to get in. Again, this is after Jesus' teaching in regards to what we just covered. And the multitude sat about him, in verse 32, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother and my brethren? And he looked round about on them which sat about him and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and mother. So Jesus clarifies here who his family is. After addressing the critics, he's clarifying it here. We see the desire of his earthly family. They want to come in to see them. He doesn't drop everything. Okay? Family is not, the physical family on earth is not the priority. He doesn't drop everything that, he, that he's doing to, 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 you know, to go and, and, and see his family. Remember when he was about 12 years old, and this happens at church sometimes too, they're at the temple, and you know, they, they return home, and they think, hey, where's Jesus? And I'm like, oh, I thought you had Jesus. You know? And he's back at the temple, you know, that's happened a few times. I thought you had him. And then they find him in the temple questioning the, the religious teachers. And he says, matter of factly, didn't you know I have to be about my father's business? In a sense, that's what's happening here. Jesus, we need to see you, you know, because they planned on forcibly taking him home. And he says, and he uses the interruption as a point of instruction. And he's looking around with the the apostles there, the 12 chosen. And he says, let me tell you who my true family is. Who are my mother? Who's my mother and my brethren? It's everyone here that does the will of God. Part of the divine family. Who are they? They are those who actually obey. 
They don't profess to be a Christian and live like a child of the devil. These are the ones who actually do what I say. The desire of his family is to see him. He uses it as, as a point of, of instruction to describe who his eternal family is, the divine family. He explains truly who are part of his family, those that do the will of God. He's not being rude to his family. You know, he's, he, he, is, he simply used their, uh, this opportunity to, to teach that God's children are closer to Jesus than even his own physical family. There is a spiritual bond that even supersedes biological or physical family. We are closer to each other than with our own uh, family of origin. In fact, Ephesians would say, we are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. We are that close. That is, that is the earthly or the spiritual tie. That's the song that we sing once a month. Blessed be the tie that truly binds the family of God. It is indestructible. So, as I close here, Jesus, was he delusional? Was he demon-possessed? Or was he actually who he said he was, divine, the Son of God? You remember C.S. Lewis? Some of you are on, probably on track with this. C.S. Lewis had a famous quote. He used, to, he used to write, you know, popular books like Chronicles of Narnia, um, he was a former atheist. He came to the faith uh, on a British Broadcasting Network Corporation. He would, he would speak on a regular basis, and th those writings became part of the book Mere Christianity, a defense of the faith. And uh, this is one of his quotes. He says, and I believe he got this whole thinking, this way of thinking, this paradigm of thinking, you know, delusional, demon-possessed or divine. He got that way of thinking from reading this passage. He says this, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that the people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is one of the things we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He's not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now, it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend, and consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely that it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. Lunatic, liar, or Lord? Jesus is Lord. And so those who are part of his family are those who will do the will of God. True conversion will manifest itself in a holy life. We had that in Matthew 7, 21, John 8, 21. If, if, if you, you are my, you're truly my disciples if you continue in my word. Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says, you remember, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. 1 John 2, 4, He that says, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. True faith will evidence itself in a life of obedience. Not a life of perfection, but a life of progress. A believer who sins and falls, he will fall forward. He will move forward. A true believer is a part of the family of God. So the question we have as I close is, are you part of the family of God? Are you walking in obedience? By repentance and faith, you may 
enter into the family of God. Bow your heads with me as we pray.